While Toronto continues to debate whether to allow a casino in its downtown core, the United States has seen many, many casinos open over the past two decades. And joining us now to tell us what fueled the expansion in Las Vegas, Nevada, David Schwartz. He's director of the Center for Gaming Research at UNLV, the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. David, it's good to have you on TVO tonight. How's things? Great. Thanks for having me. Not at all. We want to find out about this explosion, virtual explosion anyway, in casino growth in the United States over the past 20 or 30 years or so. So just start with the numbers. How many casinos were there in the States, let's say in the 1980s, and how many have you got today? Well, in the 1980s, you had two states with legalized casinos, Nevada and New Jersey, and today it's somewhere over 30, depending on how well you define a casino. It's, so it's really expanded tremendously. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to gamble, you had to fly to Las Vegas or to Atlantic City or Reno. Now, pretty much, it's maybe a three-hour drive from anywhere in the continental U.S. if you want to gamble. And why has it happened? Well, there's a lot of reasons why it happened. Uh, first reason is that Las Vegas was so successful, other states like New Jersey looked at what happened there and said, hey, we could be making money too. Then in 1978, New Jersey opened up, and after about a decade there, people in other states said, well, you know, the sky isn't falling in in New York, in Philadelphia, which are the big cities near Atlantic City, New Jersey, and maybe we should do it. And that really started an arms race among other states. So, for example, Iowa legalized it, so then Illinois did, and Indiana did, and that whole uh, tier of states went. So really, since then, it's been a pretty steady expansion. Now, we know one of the reasons that governments like to approve casinos, we're told, is that these casinos fill government coffers, which they can then go and spend on programs that people want. But unlike here in the province of Ontario, your American casinos are all privately owned and operated. So how does the government make money off them? The governments, most state governments in the United States, make money from casinos by having a special tax on gaming revenues. This is over and above the usual sales tax they would have on retail or something like that. And it can range from about 7% to well over 50%. In Pennsylvania, the rate is about 55%. And it goes even higher than that in some other states. So really, the state becomes almost a partner in some of these casinos when they are getting a lot of money from the taxes. It's very interesting. This is one of the, other, one of the reasons why casinos expanded was because in the late 80s, a lot of states were having economic problems. No governor, no state legislature in the U.S. wants to raise taxes. That makes them unpopular. Nobody wants to cut programs. That will make them even more unpopular. So they figured the casino taxes would be a voluntary tax. People could gamble if they wanted to, and the state could extract a little bit of that. So let's find out if they actually deliver on that initial promise. If the idea is build a casino, people will come, we don't have to raise taxes, and our coffers will be filled, is that in fact what has happened? Well, I think we've seen one half of that come true. We, you know, if you look at the record of casinos in the United States, you can see that they have generated a lot of tax revenue. But if you look at governments in the United States, I think the one thing they all have in common is that there's never enough money for anything. So even a state like Nevada that has a very robust casino industry making about $11 billion a year, that's not generating enough tax money for the state now. So I think it ties all back into the role of the state and should they have a lot of programs or few programs. And I think really that's a question that it's very difficult to ask casinos to answer because even if you taxed every casino in the U.S., for every cent that they made, and basically everybody worked there for free and the electric company let them keep the lights on for free and you took all that money and put it directly into state budgets, you still wouldn't have enough to cover a lot of the shortfalls. So it becomes a question of fiscal discipline, but I think for their part, the casinos have delivered gaming revenues. Let's also find out what has happened to Nevada and Atlantic City, New Jersey, now that they no longer have the monopoly on gambling across the United States. What does their picture look like? Well, it's very interesting. Nevada and New Jersey are two totally contrast, contrasting states here. So Nevada, the trouble really started there in 2000. Before that, in the 1990s, there had been a lot of riverboat gambling and tribal government gambling in areas pretty far away from the state of Nevada, so it didn't really impact it that much. In fact, it gave people a taste of what to expect in casinos, and visitation in Las Vegas picked up, and the revenues in Las Vegas picked up. In 2000, though, California tribal government started offering casinos. 
And this really started to cut into a lot of areas in Nevada, especially up north, Lake Tahoe and Reno. On the Strip, what they did was they really rebooted what they offered. And they said instead of just having quarter slot machines and buffets and that sort of thing, we're going to have more nightlife and more retail and more high-end dining, celebrity chefs. And they really created an experience that people would be willing to fly over and drive past a lot of other casinos to get to. At the same time, New Jersey didn't really do that. In New Jersey, they should have seen the writing on the wall as far back as the early 90s when Foxwoods, which is a Indian casino, opened up in Connecticut. They didn't really adjust to that. You know, as a result, in 2006, when Pennsylvania started offering casinos, New Jersey really started to decline. And since 2006, revenues in New Jersey have fallen by 41%, which is huge. So the industry is almost half what it was just six years ago there. So it, in fact, has been cannibalized, and it is not providing the, the revenues to the New Jersey Treasury that it initially hoped for. Is that fair to say? Yes. If you look at the Northeast, you can see that as the new states have come online, New York and Pennsylvania, the older states that are the more mature markets, which are pretty much New Jersey and Connecticut, have suffered. And to me, that would seem a pretty indisputable fact. You look at the numbers. Now, the question is, could New Jersey have, could the casinos in New Jersey have done something like the casinos in Nevada did, really invested more, reinvented themselves? You know, I think it's possible that they could have. So when, I think this is similar to any kind of retail or any, any kind of business, when you've got new competition, if you don't add something new, you're going to be hurt. So do you think in the United States the casino industry has reached the saturation point whereby there's no point in opening up any new ones because all you'll be doing is cannibalizing off the existing? Well, I think it's definitely getting close to that, but the question really isn't, you know, it's not fair to tell the people in the state of Ohio that you can't have casinos in your state because they've already got them in Michigan and Pennsylvania. Um, the government of Ohio is going to want that money, and that's going to be new money for them. It's bad news for Pennsylvania and Michigan, but I don't think it's fair to ask the government of Ohio to forego casino revenues and the people of Ohio to not have casinos to protect the other states. So I think really what we're seeing now is the states have to participate in a free market where people can gamble anywhere they, anywhere they want. There's not these artificial prohibitions against, against the gambling. Okay, I take what you're saying, but the example you just gave involves competing jurisdictions. So I understand that. I, I want to bring you to the province of Ontario now, where it, it's not so much a question of competing with another jurisdiction, another province, another state, but rather one city in Ontario competing with another city in Ontario. So. There's a casino in Windsor, there's a casino in Niagara Falls, there's a casino two hours north of Toronto in a place called Rama, and I wonder, based on your experience on this thing, if we were to build a casino in Toronto, would we simply be cannibalizing the revenues from those other places which are already within the province of Ontario, and therefore you're no further ahead? It's certainly possible, uh, but I think it's also important to say that you do have to evolve and go forward, and uh, it, it may be that it would cannibalize it, but I think it's very hard to say until you open it. Uh, well, of course, the opponents of, of opening up new casinos say, by that point, the, uh, the, you know, the barn door is open, the horses are gone, and if it's a mistake, it's too late to do it's a It's a $2 billion mistake, and it's too late to do anything about it. Fair point? It is, and it's a difficult question. I think it all goes back to what the purpose of the casino is. Is the purpose just to bring tax money in? Is the purpose to spur regional employment? You know, if that's the purpose and some kind of bigger development, then you have to look at what are the different casinos bringing in. So I think this is really something that the uh, legislators need to be on the same page about, and they have to have a policy discussion of what is the reason for this casino. Is it to let Ontario residents gamble. Do we want to have it to bring in tourists? You know, what is it going to be there for? Well, I appreciate again. I appreciate your position, but I want to push you a little bit more on this because we. Re I think we really need to get a better understanding. If we build a casino in Toronto, are we really going to be any further ahead? And by that I mean, if Toronto gains, is it necessarily the fact that Niagara Falls loses, that Rama loses, that Windsor loses, uh, and therefore, what's the point? It's certainly a possibility, but I don't have the numbers in front of me to be able to tell you categorically yes or no, um, whether, the, whether, whether they would suffer and how much they would. But it's, it's definitely a possibility if you look at what's happened in the U.S. historically.
Okay, fair enough. How about this? The people who are advocates of a casino in Toronto say it won't just be the locals who are using it. You'd also get people presumably coming over from Buffalo, New York, and other places close to the border. And again, based on your experience on this, is that a reasonable expectation? Well, we've seen that happen in Las Vegas, where despite a lot more competition and competition from their main feeder market in California, the casinos in the strip have done very well. So I think it's just like any other business. If it's done well and if, it's, if they're giving people something they want to go to, then yes, it could draw people in from more than just the Toronto metro area. Uh, again, we may not know that much about this, so help us out on this one. As you think of the truly sort of great world-class casinos of the world, uh, which are the ones which really do manage to get people coming in from faraway jurisdictions so that they're not merely pillaging against their other casinos in the same jurisdiction? Well, you look at a lot of areas in the United States have had casinos that have drawn from a big, from a big regional market. You know, Atlantic City, before you had so much other gambling in Pennsylvania, did. Um, Biloxi and Tunica and Mississippi have also done a good job of drawing people from a pretty broad area, not just, you know, the surrounding uh, 50 kilometers or so. So I think you've got those as more defined regional markets. Then you have Las Vegas, which is really an international market. People come to Las Vegas from all over the world, not just for the gambling, but for all of the other elements as well. And a big part of what's happened in Las Vegas in the past 20 years is the addition of convention facilities, which have really made the casinos there not really gambling halls with hotels tacked onto them, but pretty much big convention hotels that have casinos uh, tacked onto them. So I think you, if you look at it from that perspective, the bigger a facility you build that has more attractions for more people for more purposes, I think the more chance you have of drawing in people from a, from a larger radius. Let's use that as the model. Can you tell us where else in the world, what other big cities in the world, perhaps comparable to Toronto's size, we're a city of about four and a half, five million people, uh, which ones, which have the large casino, an accompanying convention center, perhaps a hotel as well, who's really doing it well and it's become one of these international tourism destination places? I think Singapore is a really good example. Uh, it's, it's very ambitious, but Singapore legalized two casinos and they were very strict about what they wanted people to build. They wanted people to build the integrated meetings and convention space with the casino. And one of them, which was built by Las Vegas Sands and Marina Bay Sands, really did deliver that. They've got an art museum in there. They've got all kinds of attractions. And they found that it actually did boost tourism and it actually also did boost the spending outside of the casino. So the restaurant spending outside the casino went up. The hotel spending outside the casino went up. So I think that is probably, I would say right now, that's a preeminent success story internationally is Singapore. You think Toronto could copy that? I think definitely Toronto could. You know, it's a little bit of a different market. It's a different continent, certainly. But I think that is the model. And a lot of people didn't think it could be done in Singapore, which traditionally was very anti-gambling. But I think the fact that it was successful there shows that it could be successful in other jurisdictions as well. Well, let me ask you about that, David, because, of course, for, for decades now, uh, many people have been using the argument that uh, there is something morally not good about having a casino in your jurisdiction. Uh, people have been beating that drum for a long time, and it doesn't look as if that argument is carrying the day anymore. Why do you think that argument seems to have lost its effectiveness? This is a fascinating historical question. This is one of the ones that I really love talking about and, and looking into. I think one of the things that really undercut the legitimacy of the moral argument against casinos was about 30 or 40 years ago when states started selling lottery tickets. A lotteries give back much less to players than casinos do. It's about 50% versus about 10%. And I think once you have a state or province that's promoting lotteries and buying advertising, telling people to buy more lottery tickets, you really undercut the idea that the state is somehow the moral protector of people. And I think a lot of people figure, well, you know, I can buy a lottery ticket here, you know, anywhere I want to in Ontario, but I've got to get in the plane to go to a casino in Las Vegas. That doesn't seem fair because they don't see the distinction between playing in a casino and buying a lottery ticket. So I think that's really the huge development. Um, there's a lot of other factors. Another one in the U.S. at least 
was development of Indian gaming. So in 1988, Congress passed the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which really streamlined the process for tribal governments to open casinos. So as they started to do it, neighboring states said, well, we've already got tribal government gaming in the area, why don't we open a casino? So I think it's really a combination of the states and provinces going into lotteries and going into the gambling business themselves and surrounding states and provinces having the same thing that has really undercut that moral argument. Another one of the sort of morality arguments that we've heard used, and <clears throat> you can tell me whether or not this is true based on your research, we've heard that casinos really only make money if they can appeal to the real problem gamblers. And by that I mean the people who are almost addicted to it, who are going to go, who are going to spend too much time there, and who are going to lose their shirt there. That's how you make the big money. Is that true? I would tend to say that's not true. Uh, certainly if you look at most casino models, they've got, they make a lot of money from a lot of people coming in and gambling. You know, if they made all their money from a few people, you wouldn't expect to see them having 2,000 slot machines. They need to get people in there. They need to generate that mass business. So I, I think that while problem gambling is certainly an issue that the industry is very concerned about, and they should be concerned about, I don't think it's fair to say that all the money is made from problem gamblers because a lot of the people who go in there and gamble are not problem gamblers and they just enjoy gambling within their means and they do it over a long period of time with no, no financial problems. Not all the money, but would you say that what separates a really profitable casino from just a profitable casino are problem gamblers? I wouldn't say that. Uh, again, it's very, first of all, it depends on how you define problem gambling. That can be very subjective. And I just don't have the data to go in there and tell you a categorical yes or no. But I, I would tend to dis disagree with that just from what I've seen in the industry and the vast numbers of people who have to come in and play a little bit of money for the casino to, to be successful over a long period of time. Okay. In the same way, I'm going to make an analogy here with bars. In the same way that society decided that it wanted to cut down on drunken driving and therefore we don't let bars stay open and all night long, we actually make them shut their gates at uh, whatever, one or two or three in the morning, <laughs> do you know any casinos who follow that same path? In other words, we're going to make sure that if somebody's in trouble as a gambler, we'll just shut down at two or three o'clock in the morning for a few hours and then we'll start up again the next day. Well, it's very interesting. In Nevada, the casinos go 24 hours a day. In other states, they've not gone 24 hours a day. I know when New Jersey started, they weren't 24 hours a day. But a lot of them have gone to that model, um, where most casinos you'll find, in the U.S. at least, are going to be open 24 hours a day. If somebody's in gambling at 4.30 in the morning, can any good come of that? It's hard to say. Uh, a lot of it might be people coming in from a different area and a, from, from a different time zone. You know, it's, it's really hard to say. And it's not like the casinos pack then. It's pretty much died down. But you will find some people gambling then. Okay, let me ask you, uh, just in our last few minutes here, I want to ask you about the uh, numbers and the projections. Because we are hearing massively um, far-flung numbers on the benefits of a casino to Toronto. We are hearing that it could be two billion dollars of financial injection, we're hearing it could be four billion. We're hearing it could be five thousand jobs, we're hearing it could be ten thousand jobs. Uh, unionized or not unionized. It seems a lot of the projections are quite all over the place. Uh, we hear some people saying that you couldn't possibly make more than fifteen or twenty million dollars from having a casino sited in downtown Toronto. We're hearing the mayor of Toronto saying he's anticipating revenues to the city of hundred and fifty million dollars. How are people supposed to make a good decision about whether this makes sense if the numbers are so all over the place? I think the answer to that is people have to look into the methodologies behind those numbers. You know, um, me not having seen the methodologies behind those numbers, I can't tell you which one is right and which one isn't. But I think whenever anybody gives you a number for anything, especially with gaming, it's a good idea to ask them how they got that number. You know, if you're looking at um, how much m money it's going to generate, or are you just taking the win per slot per day from the Windsor Casino and then multiplying that by however many slots you're going to have in Toronto, or are you getting that number in another way? So I think it's really important to look at where they get the number from and not just accept, accept whatever, whatever they give you. Okay, we're big on full disclosure on this program, so in our last minute or so here, you're the director of the Center for Gaming Research at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and I guess we need to know who funds your center. 
the state of Nevada. Do you get any money from the industry? Not directly, no. Uh, so that suggests indirectly. How so? Well, the entire state gets uh, money in their general fund. You know, they, the gambling revenues go into the general fund, but uh, there's no direct fiscal link between the center or even the university and the gaming industry that way. Um, it just, uh, as a state employee, part of my salary would come from the general fund, which is funded in part by casino taxes. Understood. Okay. And one last thing. Any advice for us? We're about to embark on this, I guess, pretty big debate at Toronto City Council at some point in the next few months. We're not sure when. Any advice as we go down this road? I think it's a really big decision, and I think it's one that people should make with the most information they can possibly get. So like I said before, if you, somebody gives you a number, break it down, see where they got that number from. Um, always look for more information because I think it's out there and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big decision. Also, make sure the decision is made, you're making the decision for the right thing. You know, if, if your goal is maximizing revenues, that could be a very different uh, decision you want to make than if your goal was to have more regional development. So be sure on, on what you're asking for. And at the end of the day, do you have a recommendation for us, up or down on the casino? I don't. You know, I'm not a, a citizen of Ontario, unfortunately, a uh, <laughs> wonderful province, but I, I think that's something that the people there need to decide for themselves. I'm sure they will, and please come visit sometime. David Schwartz from the UNLV, oh, thanks so much for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.